Totally Accurate Battle Simulator is one of my favourite games to mess around in with friends. So naturally I thought, let's make it as competitive as possible. Today we're going to try and make Tabs a competitive game that in theory could have tournaments or even a player base around it. To start we're going to need to talk about the basics of Tabs and the kind of game that it is. Tabs is a two player strategy game with many unique maps and a whole lot of units to choose from. It's known for its janky physics engine and comical approach with certain units. The game has a really robust resource system where every unit has a point cost that's roughly equal to its value. Each unit also has a tribe it fits in, but these are purely thematic. Now that we've discussed the basics of tabs, let's look at how we can play it competitively. Angry Tom has made dozens of videos about tabs on his channel, and not only was he a great inspiration for me, but he taught me a lot of mechanics I didn't even know about. Oh, she killed him. Okay. Wow. Okay, so it's just straight up. one one again. The Artemis Duel. See, this is why this game is perfectly balanced. Yeah. Like... All the units can... <laughs> <laughs> so how can tabs be played at a competitive level? The game doesn't even have a fleshed out versus mode. Luckily for us, someone out there already has made it semi-competitive, using the format of Horse. Horse is an old basketball game. Players would take turns taking shots, and then their opponents had to mimic them. If you failed, you got a letter of the word horse. If you got all five, you lost the game. This game style has been adapted to a lot of video games, such as Tony Hawk Pro Skater and Crayola Scoot. Angry Tom has adapted this and added a few changes to make it more interesting. Let's review the rules. Each player takes turn to point a set amount of points onto the field. After each round, the winner of the last round deploys that many points on top of what they already have. Then the loser does the same. If you lose a round, you get a letter of the word horse. If you get all five, you lose the game. And if you lose two or more rounds consecutively, you may clear your army and deploy a brand new army up to the full value of the game so far. Now that we've discussed how the game can be played competitively, we need to actually rank the units. So let's make a unit tier list. Since there's over 80 units, let's just summarize some of the more memorable units from each tier. D tier is full of units that either lack a niche or have overall extremely poor stats. For example, balloonists pick up units and float with them in the air before dropping them. Unfortunately, they can only pick up light units and they often die in the process. Harvesters are really expensive, slow, and overall just very underwhelming. Their cost far outweighs their value and they do very poorly in their cleave attack niche. Spear throwers do very good damage, but they don't compare to any other range unit in the game. D tier units are almost never worth using. If there's one you like, you'll find a better version of it in another tier. Let's move on to C tier. All of these units do one or two things well, and they have a lot of potential. Bombs on a stick often die before they get to attack, but when they do get to attack, they deal a lot of damage in a large area. Bone mages do a lot of damage, and can knock up light units, however they're somewhat expensive and they have a very short range. Painters are cheap fodder that don't deal very much damage at all, however they have a special ability that allows them to dodge range attacks. All C tier units are pretty good, but they need to be used properly to get the most out of them. B tier is full of reliable units, and if those units have a niche, they tend to excel in them. All of the giants are very expensive and can struggle to get around, but to make up for it, they can tank an insane amount of damage, while also dealing a lot as well. The Mace Spinner is very unimpressive, but with enough investment can turn into a giant tornado that can win games on its own. Captains are extremely good. They have a short range attack that can knock enemies away, and a strong melee attack. On top of that, they can take a lot of damage. Knights are somewhat expensive, but they make up for it with their above average stats, their shield, and their charge attack. B tier units, although not game changing, are very reliable. A tier units tend to have high power that outclass most similar units. Halflings might seem like a strange choice for an A tier unit, but they are the cheapest unit in the game, and although their base HP is very low, because of their size they can be very hard to hit, and they grapple onto units they attack, as well as pick them up. Musketeers are an extremely powerful unit, they have a long range and very high damage. Their only drawback is they have a 14 second reload time on their shots, but they're very cheap for what they do. A tier is full of staple units that should appear in every game. S tier units are extremely busted and can't be overlooked. If your opponent is using an S tier unit, 
you need to start thinking about how to respond to it. Often their unique abilities make them very hard to deal with. Balloon archers can stun lock units, and with enough arrows, can lift up almost any unit in the game. Cupid's arrows apply a charm effect, causing those hit to attack their allies nearby. And although Cupid itself is very frail, it's not easy for your opponent to exploit. Clams, if given the chance to start up, will flood the field with hundreds of summons. This causes them to chip away and distract their units from a very far range. Gunslingers fire into the air and shower down bullets in the area. This bypasses shields and deals massive damage. Finally, cheerleaders are by far the most broken unit in the game. Although they don't attack themselves, they speed up the attack speed of a nearby unit, causing them to attack at incredible speeds. This can cause some mediocre units to be absolute terrors to deal with. On top of that, the cheerleader buff stacks. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison of the difference a cheerleader can make. And that's it for units. Here's the full tier list. Of course, if we're going to try and break down the competitive scene, we can't just talk about the units. We need to also talk about the maps and which map should be playable and which shouldn't. There are two different map categories. Main maps are themed and pretty, and simulation maps are simple and controlled. Right off the bat, let's ban all the main maps. Although some of the main maps seem fair, none of them are symmetrical and it's not fair to have a competitive game where both players aren't on the exact same footing. Now onto the simulation maps. Five of them are non-symmetrical, clearly favouring one side over the other. So those are banned too. And while Spy is actually a symmetrical map, you can't adjust the camera angle during deployment, so it's not actually played symmetrically. Finally, simulation is way too big, and final destination is way too small. And that's it for the banned maps. After cutting out all 16 main maps, and 8 of the simulation maps, we are left with 14 legal maps. Let's run through them. To simplify this, we're going to break the maps down into 4 different categories. Bridges, mazes, hills, and advanced maps. Both the bridge maps have large deployment platforms with a thin bridge connecting them. The only difference between them is that one of them has rails on the bridge. All four of the maze maps have simple flat designs with some terrain differences in them. Because of these differences, some units are really good on certain maps, but terrible on the others. Both the hill maps are very simple. They have gradual changes in altitude throughout the map. The remaining six maps have more advanced designs and don't fit into simple categories like the rest of the maps. If we wanted to have a smaller map pool, these would be the six maps we should use. Port gives the players a thin bridge to fight on, with a large mosh pit beneath for units to duke it out in. Both players have plenty of space, and this map rewards good map control. Broken bridge is similar to port, but has some small differences. For example, the bridge is broken, and the space beneath is a lot smaller. King of the Hill is a very large map. It gives both players very easy access to flanks, but they have to share these platforms with their opponents. Arena shares the flank platforms from King of the Hill, but instead of going to a large center plaza, it takes place in the Colosseum. Players can also put long range units on the walls of the arena. Tiered Castle heavily rewards players for controlling the center of the map. Because of how thin the ramps are, it's not easy to move a lot of units up them at once. Finally, Double Battle is the last legal map. It gives players the chance to fight on two different fronts at the same time. There's also a shared center platform that players can put units on. So as I was finishing up on this video, Landfall dropped a brand new update for the game, including a new faction, a map, and some balance changes. So I'm going to talk about all of those here. Firstly, the map shouldn't be legal because it falls into the main category and it's not symmetrical. Now let's talk about the units and what tiers they belong in. In the C tier, we first have the Chariot. It's pretty useful at running through crowds and causing chaos, but like the Wheelbarrow and other similar units, it tends to kill itself easily. Next, the Pharaoh has a very unique ability that forces units in an area to bow while damaging them. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem that good since it doesn't affect the aim of ranged units. Now in B tier, we have the Barrel Roller, who fulfills the same role as the Bomb on a Stick. However, its explosion always goes off, even if it dies, which makes it much more reliable 
and it's also much faster. Next we have the Boxer. It's relatively bulky and it hits hard and fast, but it's not very cheap. The Blow Dart uses a range attack to apply poison, however its range isn't great. And finally the Poacher fires 3 times as quickly as an Archer, but it has a significantly shorter range. We only have one new A tier unit, which is the Peasant. It's the new cheapest unit in the game, and can be used as both fodder and stall, very similar to the Halfling. Six of the new units are S tier. The tank has the same cost as the Ice Giant, but it's very fast, very bulky, and has a massive damage range attack. Thor has a strong melee attack, but what makes him really good is that he can zap enemies with a giant thunderbolt from the sky. This effect has a hard set 10 second cooldown and isn't improved by cheerleaders. Next, the wizard hits units with an attack that makes them spin before exploding. It doesn't work as well on heavy units. The flag bearer causes units in its radius to run faster, which is really good on some units like raptors. The banner bearer causes units in its radius to stand still. This is really good on certain maps. And because this effect is technically a debuff, it causes cactuses to fire off thorns everywhere when they're affected by it. Lastly, the Pike is the longest range melee unit in the game, having over twice the range of both Vlad and the Sarissa. Its attack deals more than a Musketeer, but afterwards it drops its weapon. This makes it, for only 50 more points, an even better unit than the Musketeer at bursting down tanky units instantly. You only need 3000 points of them to instantly kill an Ice Giant, which is only half the Ice Giant's cost, whereas you need far more Musketeers to do that. The last three units of the update are banned, due to being completely overpowered, but also are not even obtainable due to their extremely high costs. All three of them have a massive health pool and absurdly high damage. The Super Boxer, who costs 100,000 points, attacks insanely fast at a melee range. The Dark Peasant, who costs infinite points, automatically blocks any range attack and is a blast that kills any unit that gets too close. The only unit that can kill it is the Super Peasant, who doesn't block attacks but moves so fast it will never get hit. Finally, let's talk about some of the buffs. Although it's too early to say whether any units have got significantly better, I will mention some of the buffs that I'm happy to see. The Mammoth gained a charge attack, making it more unique than the other giant units. The Farmer and the Hoplite gained a step forward when they attack, making their attacks more reliable. The Halberd steps backwards now when attacking, which makes it hit units much easier. The Da Vinci tank now has collision damage on its spinning cannons, which means you can't just overwhelm it with melee units like halflings now. And finally, the miner is tankier, and the blast on the attack has been increased. So what are my overall thoughts? Well, cheerleaders are very strong. Their existence causes some units, like ballistas, to be absolute terrors. On the other hand, some units, like the Gatling gun, aren't as good as they could be because they don't synergize well with the cheerleaders. Honestly, the raw strength of cheerleaders could make the game worse competitively. However, because cheerleaders are relatively expensive, it takes some time to get working, which means the player on the receiving end has more time to respond. On top of that, some units, like the Snake Archer, do a very good job keeping cheerleaders and their buffed units busy. So despite how good cheerleaders are, there are still some counters to them. For now, that's all we're going to go over about tabs. Feel free to leave a like or subscribe. If you have thoughts about the video, do you think cheerleaders are secretly terrible? Do you think balloons are the best unit in the game? Please let us know. The best way to develop competitive knowledge is to discuss everything. Thank you so much for watching.